Now, <clears throat> in Exodus chapter 12, just to kind of bring us uh, into a semblance of where we are in this, in this story, we've already seen there are uh, the, the different plagues that have been happening to Egypt. Egypt has already had nine specific plagues that have, have uh, been levied on it because Pharaoh refuses to let the people of, of Israel go. And time and time again, he makes a concession. He decides he's going to do it, and then he decides, no, I'm not going to do that. And time and time again, these plagues continue to destroy Egypt over and over and over again. Well, in chapter 11, we now see Moses one last time going to, to Egypt, going to Pharaoh and telling him, you need to let my people go because God says this last and final plague is going to be like something you haven't seen. What's going to happen is all of the firstborn, they are all going to perish. Not just the firstborn of the Egyptians, but also your slaves, anyone who is firstborn in Egypt, to include cattle, will all perish on this one night. And Pharaoh refuses to hear any of it. He's not going to listen to it, and he sends them away. And Moses leaves in a frustrated manner. And then in chapter 12, verse 1, we now come up to what we see is the institution of the Passover. Here God now calls Moses and Aaron together and he tells them this is the Passover. This is what it signifies. This is how we see. So let's, let's pick up <clears throat> and read this. And we're going to read a, a good portion of this uh, relatively quickly, but we'll, we'll talk about a couple of points as we go through here. So the first thing you see in chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be the beginning of months for you. It is, for, uh, it is, it is to be the first of, this, of the month for, of the year uh, to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, one, uh, On the tenth month, uh, on the tenth of this month, they are each to take a lamb for themselves according to their father's household, a lamb for each household. <clears throat> now, if the household is too small for the lamb, he, is, he and his neighbor nearest to his house are to take one according to the number of the persons in them. According to, each, uh, according to what each man should eat, you are to divide the lamb. Your lamb shall be an unblemished male, uh, a year old, and, and you, I'm sorry, you may take it from the sheep and from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation in Israel is to kill it at twilight. Moreover, he says, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lentil of the houses uh, in which they eat it. So here we have the institution of the Passover, and we have some information that is given to us. We have uh, both uh, the institution as also what the selection is going to be, what you need to do during this time frame. He says that there is a change. There is a, a new beginning that is there for now the children of Israel. And, he, and it is marked by the first month now. They are going to change their calendar. They're going to focus this. This will be the first month of the year for them. And they are, uh, with all their household, they are to bring in, select a lamb or a goat, and uh, that lamb or goat can be shared by small households. They are to take this lamb or goat, and it's not to be just any lamb or goat. This lamb or goat has to be unblemished, has to be unspotted, has to have no, no uh, issues with it. It is to be the best of, of those that are selected, and it is to be no more than a year old. And they are to kill this lamb at the 14th day, and then take the blood of that lamb, spread it on the, the doorpost as well as the lentil of the doors of those that are eating it. And he says there's an addition here that we don't read of right here, but look in chapter 12 in verse 46. In chapter 12, verse, verse 46, we're also told it is to be eaten in a single house. You are not to bring forth any of the flesh outside of the house, nor are you to break any of their bones. So here you see that the lamb is, is also to be prepared in such a way that none of the bones are to be broken. Now, it's important for us to see these, each and every one. And we'll, we'll talk about a little bit more of those as you read ahead on your, your um, handouts. I'm sure that you have already seen some of the connections that we're going to be making. But then you have in Exodus chapter 12, verse 8 and through 11, you see how the lamb is supposed to be eaten. In verse 8, it says, They shall eat the, the flesh 
that same night roasted with fire and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs do not eat any of the raw or do not eat any of it raw or boiled all of it uh, or all with water but rather roasted with fire both his heads and his legs with his entrails and you shall not leave any until morning uh, everything he says anything that is eaten or anything that is left until morning is to be burned and then verse 11 you shall uh, eat it in this manner how are you supposed to be wearing what are you supposed to be wearing he says your gir- your loins are to be girded your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand and you shall eat it in haste it is the lord's passover so here we see not only is the lamb supposed to be prepared in a specific way it's supposed to be roasted it's supposed to be eaten everything is supposed to be taken off of that lamb and then it is to be consumed inside their homes None of the leftovers are supposed to be there. Anything that is left over is to be burned. And then we see that it is also to be eaten in haste. Now, it tells us that they are to put their robes or, or uh, gird up their loins is the word that is used here. And girding up their loins meant simply to take the robes and cinch it between their legs. It was a way to prepare themselves to move. It, was, it would give them more flexibility and movement. And, and so he says, they are to gird, your, your gird up your loins, to put sandals on your feet, have your staff in your hand. And then while you're eating this, you're almost like if you're getting ready to take off. And he says that the, the reason this is all being done in this fashion is look with me in chapter 11. In chapter 11, verse 1. In chapter 11, verse 1, we see now the Lord said to Moses, one more plague I will bring on Pharaoh, on Egypt. And after that, uh, he will let you go from there. When he lets you go, he will surely drive you out completely. Pharaoh's not going to just let you go. Pharaoh's going to push you out. And look in chapter 12, verse 31. In chapter 12, verse 31, we see that this is exactly what happens. In chapter 12, verse 31 to 34, it says, uh, Then he called for uh, Moses and Aaron on the night, and this is the night after the, all the deaths. And he says, Rise up, get out from among your people, both you and, your, and the sons of Israel. Go and worship the Lord, just uh, as you have said. Take both your flocks and your herds, as you have said. Go uh, and bless me also. In verse 33, the Egyptians urged the people to, and, uh, to send them out to the land in haste, for they said we will all be dead the people are not they're not just leaving they're hurrying out of there because people are literally pushing them out they want them out they want them gone so fast look at what it says in verse 34 so the people took their dough before it was leavened with their kneading bowls bound up in cloths on their shoulders here the leaven uh, a dough they they would normally put a little bit of, of leaven inside there it would leaven the dough and then they would kind of use this we we talked about this earlier in the luke passages where it says a peck of of leaven is put into uh that that um that dough so here you have the same thing they would carry this dough ball and it would leaven but here this says they didn't even have chance to leaven the dough so it is also referred to in in verse 11 as the lord's passover this isn't the people's passover but the lord's passover now look in verse 12 of chapter 12 because in verse 12 chapter 12 we see the purpose of this passover is given to us as well It tells us in verse 12, For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike down the firstborn of the land, both man and beast, against all all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you and the house where you live. And where, when I see the blood, I will pass over, you, uh, pass over you, and no plague will befall you, and you will, de- and uh, befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Now this day will be a memorial to you, and you, are, you, and you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You are to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. So here we're told in these next verses that not only were they supposed to take this, but the purpose was it was to be a significant memorial. It was something that they were supposed to remember because first they were being sent out. It was God's hand who was taking them out, but also they were to put this blood. That blood was to signify something. It was to it was a sign to the Lord. Not notice it says a sign to the Lord, not a sign to the people. It was a sign for the Lord so that when he saw that he would pass over that that home. 
he would not have the destroyer. The destroyer would not come in. As a matter of fact, 20, verse 23 tells us this very same thing. In verse 23, it gives us a little bit more understanding as it says, For the Lord will pass through uh, to smite the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lentil and the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to smite you. Now I want you to understand, this little caveat, this little information that is given to us, is tells us something very important, that there was a condition to the salvation that they were receiving. There was something specific. If they did not have those doorposts with the blood of the lamb and the lentil covered with the blood of the lamb, if they weren't doing those specific things, then there would no, not be a Passover because there would not be a sign to stop the destroyer from coming into the home. So here we see a sign, a glimpse of how God is putting a condition upon the salvation of the Israelites here. And the, we read in verse 4 that the, it, was, it was also a memorial for uh, all generations that would, would go on forward. So let's continue to read on in, in verse 15 now. <clears throat> in verse 15 it says, Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, but on the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whosoever eats anything leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day you shall have a holy assembly, and on another holy assembly on the seventh day. No work, shall, uh, all, uh, no work at all shall be done on them except what must be eaten by every person. In verse 17, you shall observe the feast of the unleavened bread on, uh, for on this very day I brought, you out of the ho I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a permanent ordinance. And he goes on and he says that in the first month of the 14th day at evening, they're not to eat any unleavened bread. This is telling us that it is during the Passover. As the Passover starts, so is, does the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. It takes place as well. And when the, the Feast of the Unleavened Bread starts the 14th day of the month, it continues for seven days. Seven days they are not to have any leaven, in the, in, uh, consume any leaven or have any leaven in their homes. Look in verse 19. Seven days there shall be no leaven found in your, home, in your houses. For whosoever eats, the, eats what is leaven, that person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel. Whether he is an alien or a native of the land, you shall not eat any, anything leavened in your dwellings. Uh, you shall not, I'm sorry, in all your dwellings you shall eat unleavened bread. So here we see not only do you have the institution of this feast of unleavened bread that happens within the Passover, but it tells us that there anyone who violated that would be cut off from Israel. Now that's a pretty steep price for eating leaven. But again, it is a condition that is put on by God. God says, this is what you will do and no one is to do this. You are not to have leaven. Not only are you not to consume it, but you're not even to have it in your home. And he says, again, this is because it is a memorial. It is a something to remember. You need to do this so that you will observe it and generations to follow will also observe it as a memorial of what God did for them. Now we read in verse 24 that this memorial from verses 24 to 27, this memorial wasn't uh, just something that they needed in this time frame, but it was something that was to be taught taught to generation to generation. Look in verse 24. And you shall observe this event and uh, as an ordinance for your children, for you and your children forever. When you enter the land which the Lord uh, will give you, as he had promised, you shall observe this right. And when your children say to you, what does this right mean? You shall say, it is a Passover sacrifice who, uh, of the Lord who passed over the houses of the sons of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians, but spared our homes and the people bowed low and worshiped. Here he says, not only do you need to do this, not only do you need to observe it in a specific way, not only is this is what the meaning of it is, but you are to teach this to your children. You let, you, it, it, it should inspire questioning from them. They are going to look at you doing this specific thing. Why is there no leaven? Why are we having to eat this? Why are we doing it in this manner? What are, and those questions draw upon the, the explanation that the Lord did this for us. 
The Lord delivered us out of Egypt. The Lord went ahead and, and took not only us out of Egypt, but he took us out of haste. And through his strength, through his abilities, he was able to, to do all these wonderful things. It is a reminder, a, a reminder for all of them. Now, so, so important was these, were these memorials that if you look in Numbers chapter 6, and, and I want you to put a placeholder in Exodus because we're going to come right back. But in Numbers chapter 6, verse 9 through 6, uh, I'm sorry, verses uh, 6 through 14, Numbers chapter, and I'm set 6 as Numbers chapter 9, Numbers chapter 9, verses 6 through 14. Here we see there are only a very small amount of exceptions to not partake of the Passover feast when it was commanded to do so. In verses 6 through 14, we're told that they were, those that, that uh, were unclean, those who had touched a dead body, that they were not able to take the Passover. They were having to separate themselves from everyone. And here they ask Moses, well, what do we do? And Moses inquires from God what they should do. And they are told that they are to partake of the Passover feast on the second month of the 14th day. And they are to partake of it, both those who are traveling at that time and those who are unclean. But he also says, if they don't do this, if you do not partake of this uh, Passover feast when it is commanded, then you will also be cut off from the people and the people will bear their sins. What does that tell us? This Passover was extremely important for them to take. The Lord saw it as a very serious thing that needed to be done. Now, when we look at all this, that's all great information. It's, it's a great story. We go ahead and hear this and we tell it to our children all the time. But what significance does it have for us? Is there any significance for us in this recount of this Passover? Why am I telling you all of this? You see, when we look at the Passover what it was, the purpose, how it was taken, all of these things. The simple truth is the Passover is what we classify as a Christ type. See, the Passover was something that pointed forward. It, it was a foreshadowing of something to come. Although we no longer observe the Old Testament on the Mosaic Law, we don't do those specific things. We are able to look back at the Old Testament. We are able to look at the history and we are able to find things that are pointing to Jesus. You know, our, our uh, uh, theme for this year is let me see Jesus. We are to look in the Old Testament and find how Christ is continually pointing pointed to in the scriptures. Christ didn't just come on scene in the New Testament and that was it. The Lord just sprung a surprise. It was something that was foretold all the way as far back as probably Genesis. You can see in Genesis, you see that, that serpent being told uh, that you will bruise his heel, but he will bruise your head, giving us a foreshadowing of Christ. And then you have here this Passover, this Passover gives us a strong confirmation that Jesus has some unmistakable, unique similarities and is overwhelmingly being pointed to as the sacrifice that takes away all sins from people. How God delivered his people, not from the land of Egypt, from, from sin itself. You see, Paul tells us this very thing. Look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, here Paul is talking to the church at Corinth and he's rebuking them. He's telling them they should have executed, uh, executed church discipline upon a, a gentleman that has been having an a unfaithful or a, a, a unauthorized or wrong uh, um, relationship with his stepmother. And he says, you haven't even brought this to light. You haven't even said anything to him. He is in sin, he is in active in sin, and instead of saying something, instead of doing something, all you've done is turned a blind eye to it. 
And Paul says that I am not going to turn a blind eye. I have to say something and I'm going to let them. And he, that's why he says in verse 6, your boasting is not good. Do you not know a little leaven leavens the whole lump dough? Clean out the old leaven that, so that you may be a new lump, just as, as you are in fact unleavened. Now I want you to start picturing some of these different kind of things that are happening. He's talking about taking the, un, uh, the leaven out of that lump of dough, making yourself this unleavened dough. And then he brings it very, very uh, focused into the Passover. He says, for Christ, our Passover also has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but the, leaven, the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Here, Paul highlights the fact that he, we are to remove the leaven of sin from our lives, and we are not to allow those things to dwell into our lives and start to fester in our lives, as well as in our church. In the Lord's church, we, if we see something that needs to be addressed, we need to address it. And therefore, he says, look, the Lord Christ is our Passover. Now, with the remainder of the time, I want to kind of do these connections really quick. So let's look at some of the connections between the Passover and between Christ. As we see these strong kind of similarities that are being told to us. First of all, the Passover lamb... The Passover lamb was specifically for the people of, of Israel. Look back again in Exodus chapter 12, verse 3. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 3, here we have that the commandment is given for Moses and Aaron to speak to the congregation of Israel and then deliver them the information about the Passover, the institution of the Passover. Again, who was this for? This was for the congregation of Israel. That's who was supposed to be honoring this Passover. Jesus is the Passover that, but he's not the Passover for just the small congregation of Israel. He is the Passover for the world. John the baptizer said in John chapter 1, verse 29, he, when he sees Christ coming to him, before Christ is baptized, he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the, the sin of the world. Christ didn't come to take away the sins of certain people. Christ came to take the sins of all the world. But, you know, we look at that and we say, but what's the real big similarity there? When Christ is, takes the, the sin of the world, do we understand that we need to accept that, that gift? That gift of salvation, it's just like the Passover lamb. We have to take it. We have to do something with it. And here we're told that Christ, he saves us, the body of Christ, which is called Israel, the new Israel. Look in Romans chapter 9, verses 6 through 8. In Romans chapter 9, verses 6 through 8, here Paul he, he talks about how he desperately wants to save his countrymen. He wants them to understand that God has not gone ahead and just dismissed them and said, you know what, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to honor the, the promises that I said that I was going to save Israel. And he says, but the problem is, they were thinking that Israel, being part of Israel, was meant the physical part of Israel. So long as I'm born into Israel, I'm, I'm saved. And therefore, Paul says, but in verse 6, it is not though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel, not all, uh, not, nor are, are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants. And he says, the, the ones that are, are the, the true Israel, the, it is not the one of the flesh in verse 8, but the children of the promise regarded as descendants. Well, who is that? Who is that new Israel? Who is he talking about? If you look in Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, we're told exactly who that is. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, we're told in verse 26 that those who are baptized in Christ put on Christ. But then he also continues on and he says as I go ahead and find this real fast. 
Galatians chapter 3, verse 29, he says, And you, those who were baptized into Christ, who have clothed themselves with Christ, and if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. Here he's talking about those descendants, those who are Israel, those are the ones that are spiritual Israel, those who have accepted the gospel, those who have come through Christ. So when we look at this, the first thing, as we saw, the Passover lamb is for Israel. It was specifically for Israel. Then it is still for the spiritual Israel today, those who are coming through Christ. But let's see the next portion. The next one is that the lamb was without blemish. Now, we, we understand in Exodus chapter 12, verse 5, that it was told that this lamb was supposed to be spotless. It's supposed to have no blemishes. In other words, no deformities, no, no problems with that animal. It was supposed to be the best of the flock. Well, do we understand that Christ is also, Jesus is the best of the flock. He was spotless. Well, how was Jesus spotless? Not in the physical sense, but in the spiritual sense. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, that's exactly what the Hebrew writer talks about. The Hebrew writer says that we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things, yet without sin. This morning we were talking about how Christ, how can Christ be my, my savior if he does not know what I'm going through? How can he be the perfect high priest? How can he be that perfect sacrifice if he, if he was God and just basically had no emotions, can go through all things, didn't have any problems getting through temptation because he's Christ, he's God. He's, he's able to get through that, no problem. Then he would not be able to sympathize with you nor me because we have to go through that. We have to deal with sin. We have to have people, people in, in this world that are going to challenge us and hurt us and do things to us. And we're going to have to live through problems and all these issues. And Christ, Christ was perfect because he went through that even though he had the power to stop it. He had the power that none of us have and yet he was still able to go ahead and overcome that temptation and live this world without sin. But we're also told that God didn't just send Christ, he sent the best of what he had. In John chapter 3, verse 16, well-known verse, we are told that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Christ was not just some random person, he was the son of God. He was deity that came from the glory of the Lord and came down from heaven and he made himself man and suffered and bled and died. That was the best of the flock. But the next thing that we also see doesn't sound too impressive. The next thing we see is just as we were told, we saw in Exodus chapter 12, verse 46 and Numbers chapter 9, verse 12, we saw that there were no broken bones inside that Passover lamb. And then we say, well, what big deal is that? Well, we have to understand, look with me in John, in John chapter 19. In John chapter 19, verse 32 to 36, here we're told about Christ's crucifixion. And here Christ is on the cross and there on the Sabbath day. They tell them, hey, you know what? We need to get these guys gone quickly so that we, because we have the Sabbath that has to be honored and we can't have these guys there. No, no work can be done. So they've been ordered to go and break all the legs of all those that are on the cross. And we're told this, uh, in verse 32, so the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man and the others who were crucified with him. But coming to Jesus, we, uh, when they saw that he was already de dead, they did not break his legs, but they pierced his side. And then we're told in verse uh, in verse 35, and he who has seen has testified and his testimony is true and he knows that he is telling the truth so that, all, uh, so that you may also believe. For these things came to pass to fulfill the scripture, not a bone of him shall be broken. See, Christ was, that was a fulfillment of prophecy. 
The fact that he was the Passover lamb, he could not have a bone break, broken. Now, it's important, and, and it seems very simple, but sometimes I hear when we are talking about the Lord's Supper that we refer to the broken body of Christ. Now, I understand what the meaning is. I understand that, the, that what we're trying to say is the, the bruised and battered body of Christ. But we need to be very careful because what it sounds like is the broken bones of Christ. And if Christ had any broken bones, he could not be the Messiah because he would not have fulfilled the prophecy. So we need to understand all prophecies were filled by Christ. So it is significant when we look at the Passover lamb that had no bones broken. And then we see flash forward all the way into the New Testament, Christ, no bones broken. And it is a fulfillment of the prophecy. We are linked together. But what about the next one? See, <clears throat> we also see that the Passover lamb was sacrificed for the people prior to their salvation. They were sacrificed for the people prior to their salvation. See, the, the lamb was slaughtered on the 14th day. And then the, the blood was put on the doorposts. The destroyer passed over the doorposts and then they were sent out. They were saved, they were redeemed, they were taken away from Egypt. They were saved by the hand of God. Jesus similarly had to be slain before we could have salvation. Look with me in Hebrews. In Hebrews, this is exactly what the Hebrew writer is getting at. In Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 through 15, the Hebrew writer says this, But when Christ appeared as the high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the, great and, uh, the greater and more perfect tabernacle, tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of, bulls and, uh, the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained the eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and ashes of heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify the cleansing of the flesh, how much more would the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? For this reason he is the mediator of the new covenant so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of transgressions that were committed under the first covenant those who have been called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance and if you drop down to verse 22 it tells us and according to the law one may almost say all things are cleansed with blood and without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sins. Christ was that, that liberation for us. Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, he says that we were not saved, we were not redeemed by physical things like silver and gold. He says we were redeemed not by perishable things of silver and gold, but instead we were redeemed by the precious blood of the lamb, the unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Now, that word redeemed, that word redeemed right there means liberated by payment. See, Christ liberated us by the payment of his blood. He went ahead and redeemed us through his blood. And therefore, we're told in Romans chapter 5, verse 9, that we have been justified by his blood. We shall be then saved we shall be redeemed, we shall be justified, and then be able to have God's wrath pass over us. We are no longer those enemies of God. Instead, we are now those of his children. But the next thing we also see is the lamb was consumed. The lamb was consumed during this Passover. Everything had to be consumed. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 8, we're told that. But do you understand that Christ tells us that we need to consume him as well? Now, there's two ways that we're talking about in this sense. The first one we find in John chapter 6. In John chapter 6, verses 53 through 58, here John records for us that Christ says some very difficult words to those that are listening. So difficult that many of the disciples were told, leave. Because they, can't, they say it's too difficult to understand. They don't understand what he's talking about. Because Christ says to them, Truly I say to you, unless 
you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. That's pretty difficult to understand. Christ is saying, you need to eat my blood and eat, and, or eat my uh, flesh and drink my blood so that you can have eternal life. And obviously, they're looking at this and saying, is he talking about cannibalism? What, what is he talking about? How can we eat your flesh and drink your blood? And Christ comes on and continues in verse 55. He says, for my flesh is the true food and my blood is the true drink. And he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. And then he says in verse 58, this is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. Christ is not talking about eating literally his, his body and his blood because he was alive during that time frame and he was not doing those things. But what is Christ saying? He is saying that we need to live in fellowship with his words. We need to consume the things that he is teaching and we need to have him inside, abide in him so that he abides in us. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, that's exactly what Paul was getting at when he said, I no longer live, but it is who Christ who lives in me. You see, Christ was inside. He says he was inside me. It's not that Christ, that you had a little Christ inside him. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, Christ abides in me because I'm following the things and the commandments of the Lord. I live as if I'm living with Christ inside of me, doing and guiding and directing me to all things and all, and how I act and how I say and what I do. But we said there was two things. Because the first one is I need to have Christ abide in me by doing his will and obeying his will and le learning and continuing to do the things that he has asked of me. But the second thing is that we need to also partake of his flesh and his blood which is this memorial that we see the Passover giving us. Every time that it was discussed, the memorial and the unleavened bread, is, they are uh, the, the Passover and the unleavened bread, they are memorials. They are those that are supposed to be continually done on a yearly basis. They were to do this over and over again so that they would never forget. And they were to talk about it. They were to teach their generations that were coming behind them. They were to show them and help them understand the importance of what it all meant. Well, it's the same thing that we have today. You see, we're told that Christ, being our Passover, he instituted a memorial for us. He instituted this memorial on Matthew chapter 26, verse 26 to 29, where he says, take, eat, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. Look in, in, in uh, 1 Corinthians, if you turn there, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 27. Because we know that we are not taking of this Passover feast, uh, or this memorial feast, the Lord's Supper on an annual basis. We're told, and we see the example in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, that they are, we are to take it on the first day of the week, every first day of the week. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we also see, as we had talked about before, that it needs to be free from leaven. It cannot have the leaven of sin inside of it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, here Paul is, is rebuking the church at Corinth because they had been taking the Passover, um, I'm sorry, taking the Lord's Supper in an, in an unworthily manner. They were going and essentially centering on self and doing and indulging their own, their own appetites and forgetting about everybody else. And, and it was not really about Christ. They were just taking it as a common meal. And he says then, those that, that are partaking of the Lord's Supper, not only in verses 24 and 25, are we doing it in remembrance, in memorial of him, and proclaiming his death until he comes in verse 26, but those who are partaking should partake of it in a worthy manner. Not a uh, worthy manner as in having absolutely no sin, being perfect, that's not what he's saying. He's saying we need to be taking it in the right manner, making sure that what we are doing is correct and how God wants us to do it is correct. We should not be centered on ourselves. We should not have sin being dwelling in ourselves so that we are doing these, this, the Lord's Supper in an unworthily manner in this way. And he says in verse 29 or in verse 20 that we need to examine ourselves because if we don't, then we eat and drink ju uh, judgment to ourselves. 
Isn't it interesting that Christ went ahead and instituted the Lord's Supper on what day? He instituted it during the Passover. You see, Christ ends up connecting the Passover for us and saying, this is the connection. The connection, I am the connection. I am showing you how it has been pointing to me the entire time. And now on the Passover feast, I'm instituting a new memorial. The one that is not the deliverance of just the people of Israel, but the deliverance of all the world through my blood. Finally, the last thing that I want to talk about is the fact that this Passover, this Passover was for those who were circumcised. Physically circumcised Israel then needed to have that circumcision in order to take up the Passover. We see this being talked about in Exodus chapter 12, verses 43 through 44, where he says that the Passover, no foreigner is to eat of it, but the slave that is purchased is to also be circumcised and then they can eat of it. Circumcision was a must for the males of, of, of Israel before they could partake of this Passover. Well, do you understand we are also to be circumcised as well? Not the physical circumcision, but the spiritual for circumcision, the circumcision of the heart. I want you to hear exactly. It, go to Colossians, and this will be the last verse. Colossians chapter 2, verse 10. Colossians chapter 2, verse 10. I thank you very much for your attention. I know that this has been a lot of information, but it's important. It's important information that we need to know. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 10 to 12, we're told this. And in him you have been made complete. In who? That is in Christ. You have been made complete. He is the head over all rule and authority. And in him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which we are also raised up with him through the faith in, wor in the working of God who raised him up from the dead. Paul makes it clear to us that if we are to partake of the Lord's Supper in a worthily manner, we must be circumcised in our heart, therefore we must be baptized into the body of Christ, to have communion with Christ. If there are those who are taking of the Lord's Supper, but not baptized into Christ, you are doing it in an unworthily manner according to the Scriptures. So today, we've gone ahead and we've looked at a lot. <laughs> we've looked at a lot of important and significant information about the Passover feast, as well as the unleavened bread and how it is a foreshadowing of Jesus and the salvation that he brought to all mankind. See, the Passover was indeed an important memorial that God instituted for the people of Israel at that time to help them and to remind them. But today, we as Christians have a reminder of something that is far greater. You see, it isn't the physical things that we are leaving. We don't, we're not remembering the physical departure from slavery. We're remembering the departure from spiritual slavery. We're remembering that we have not a temporary freedom from a, an oppressor. We have an eternal freedom from sin. So my question to you tonight is this. Would you like to commune with Christ and rejoice in your deliverance? If your answer is yes, then you need to come to Christ in the manner that he has asked. You need to get right with Christ. You need to understand that he asks of us specific things through the scriptures. And when we look at the scriptures, it tells us that we need to accept the gospel call. To be part of his, his fold. To end up having that communion in the Passover. If we are not there, we need to get there. 